Someone you can rely, who's always on your side. That's why there's nationwide. That's why there's nationwide. Nationwide is on your side. Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company and Affiliates, Columbus, Ohio. Live from Southern California, this is the Jim Rome Show. Let me start with the association. James Harden was on the bench last night for the Sixers. Even though he did not play, you could already feel his impact. For instance, there was his impact on Joel Embiid's game when the big fella attempted a Harden step back and failed miserably. Take it pop and beat. Oh, is not allowed. Well, no, legal plan. Maybe at the Y in the park. You don't think someone would call that? Well, they'll call it, but you argue. <laughs> <laughs> and you may be able to get away with it if you're his size at the park. Oh, I love Joel. He's having an amazing year. That was an amazingly bad idea. It's all right. Then there was the impact in the Twitter Twitter sphere that the entire world got a look at James Harden's outfit and the entire world reacted to it because it was, how do I put this? It was, well, I don't know what the hell that was. A massive red overcoat slash blazer minus the sleeves instead of sleeves that matched the jacket or a part of the jacket. For some reason, he had brown corduroy sleeves. Here is a look at James Harden tonight. Like, I've been looking at him all night and all morning, and I still have no idea what that was. Listen, style is a really personal thing, right? I have mine, you have yours, and Harden definitely has his. I mean, who will ever forget when his kicks dropped back in the day? You know, the famous Adidas Harden 1 triple black. The kicks that look like burnt baked potato. The kicks that inspired the tweet that read, Finally, Harden makes a basketball shoe for me. Signed, a waiter at Chili's. Which was perfect. You know, the kicks that inspired the, What are those? What are those? Soundbite. Again, style's personal. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to say that I'm not here to judge. I'm here to say that I have no idea what the hell that fit was all about. And if your take is, yo, Rome, you just don't get it. My response to your take would be, exactly. I don't get it. That's exactly what I'm saying. I just don't get it. I mean, dude ate his way out of Houston. Maybe he's already decided that he hates it in Philly, too, and he's trying to style or bad dress his way off that team as well. You always want to be careful in what you wear for the first day on the job because that can set the tone for the rest of your time at that company. For example, there was a guy, this is a true story now, there was a guy who worked on my TV show back in the day who showed up to work wearing a purple suit back in the day. He got glossed grimace. One bad decision, one bad day, and this dude is grimace forever. I don't even know his name. I just know he's grimace. You show up looking like a character from McDonald land, and I don't care how good you are at your job, you never, ever shake that handle. So I'm saying right now, Harden better win a ring this year, or else he will ever ever or forever be remembered for that look. He will never shake that look. Folks are already calling it a curse already. And again, look, I'm not here to judge somebody's fashion, but if the mantra is look good, feel good, feel good, play good, the Sixers felt horrible, looked horrible, felt horrible, and played even worse after seeing Harden's get up. Because while he was sitting up in here looking like a Marvel villain, the Sixers were getting blasted by Fitty in the second half. Yes, I said 50 in an NBA game in their own house, and they're allegedly a contender. So you tell me, who made a worse first impression? James Harden in that getup or his new teammates by trailing by half a hundy in the second half? Now, I'm not going to say that entire loss is on Harden, but a lot of it is. How the hell were they supposed to shoot Defend, hit the glass, move the ball, and get up and down when they spent that entire game looking at Harden in that costume that he showed up in. But 
I did not just come here to crack on James Harden for showing up with a historically bad fit. I've actually come to address the Brooklyn Nets and the demise of that big three. (laughs) And what a ride that was, right? What an absolutely horrible, tedious, and insufferable ride that was. A ton of noise and sound and self-hype that led absolutely nowhere. Remember when Kevin, Kyrie, and James all came together? Remember when everybody was so convinced that they were just going to run off one championship after another? Not win one, but stack them. Win 70 plus per year. Remember when folks were saying, yeah, but the defense... Yeah, but the defense doesn't matter because the offense is just so explosive. Who cares if they give up 120 every night, if they score 140 every night? Remember when everybody said their chemistry would be fine because they want to play together? Remember all that? Yeah, well, I hate to say I told you so twice in one week. But I was right about the Rams and I was right about the Nets because that was not just a failure. That was a complete and abject disaster. One of the all-time super team, super meltdowns. James Harden arrives in Brooklyn last January. He's gone this February. Grand opening, grand closing, did not even last 13 months. In other words... Harden got one look at Kyrie Irving and said, nah, nah, I'm good. In fact, I'm not good. I'm out of here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'd really like to win an NBA title, but not if I have to do it and run with that part-time flat earth truther. These guys got three Hall of Famers together, and they managed to win one playoff series. One. Three Hall of Famers, three legends, and a single playoff series. There's an epic ROI. And the only thing that I think makes it worthwhile, I guess, is that they got a decent haul from Philly when they finally gave up on this big three. Or better yet, big two and a half. Not only did they not last 13 months, (laughs) it's the best part. They didn't even last 20 games. They played a total of 16 games together. 16 games. The trio that fought so hard to get together and were going to dominate the league played less than a half of a half of a season together. 16 games. All of that. All of that trouble. All that hype for what? 16 games. Vince Young declaring the 2011 Philadelphia Eagles a, quote, dream team. Cannot believe what a disaster this group was. And the thing is, it was all so predictable. Because each one of these three is so predictable. KD, prickly, even in the best of times. Kyrie is Kyrie all of the time. And the KD-Kyrie combination is the combination of the prickliest guy in the West and the prickliest guy in the East. And then they brought in a guy who slaps his name on a pair of baked potatoes, wears them as shoes, and then celebrates dunks with an invisible nosebleed, which is actually kind of funny. But anyway, you bring together a guy who used to get bent that Mo Buckets was nicknamed Mo Buckets, And then combine him with a flat earth truther and a part-time player. And then a guy who partied and ate his way out of Houston. And it went horribly. No way. You know me. I tend to see things on the positive. The glass is half full. All of that. So although it would appear things went horribly, I would say in my book, things went perfectly. It took them less than 14 months for all of them to get so sick of each other, they had to give up. Reportedly, KD was tired of Harden. And you can't tell me Harden was not tired of Kyrie. There's no way Kyrie's act had nothing to do with this. Because it says right here, it had a ton to do with this. Harden was clearly pissed that Kyrie was playing as a part-timer. And he even said as much yesterday. And while he claimed that he and Kyrie are still friends, he did add the following. You know, whatever he was going through or is still going through, that's his personal preference. Uh, but it definitely did impact the team because originally, you know, obviously me, Kyrie, and Katie on the court, you know, and winning covers up a lot of that stuff. But, 
it was unfortunate that, you know, we played 16 games out of whatever it was, and, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. And what it is is hilarious. The, the big three that were going to be historic only survived 16 games together. And by the way, when he says it impacted the team, hell yes, it impacted the team. When a guy who fancies himself as a leader is not there half the time, you're not going to win and he's not going to lead. You can't win and lead with a part-timer. Look, I'm not saying that Harden was a saint in all of this. Far from it. But no wonder he was pissed. That's not what he signed up for. And winning does cover up a lot of stuff. It does. Except they weren't winning. They were three games over 500. That's where they are right now. They're a playing team at the moment. They're closer to missing the playoffs than they are winning the East. And honestly, it's awesome. Give me an A or give me an F. And that big three, well, that big two and a half, gave me an F minus. Good job, fellas. Great work. Feel free to hang a 2021 playoff participation banner in the rafters. Yesterday, Harden was asked, hey, bottom line this for me, dude. Why did you want out of Brooklyn? Why did you want out of Brooklyn, and, and why did you want Philadelphia to be your destination? Um, originally, you know, when I was going through everything I was going through, uh, you know, in Houston, uh, Philly was my, you know, my first choice. Uh, it just didn't happen. Oh, oh, I bet that's news to KD. Kev probably would have wanted that kind of info back when he was leaving Golden State. All right, so Philly was your first choice. How about next season? Is Phoenix going to be your first choice? Is Milwaukee going to be your first choice? Is going back to OKC going to be your first choice? Or with that outfit, is your first choice Tatooine with the other Jedi Knights? So good. Give me an A or give me an F minus. Hey, I know that sound. In fact, I love that sound. It's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify actually is amazing. It gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. What I'm saying is, scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Believe me. I mean, you wouldn't believe how this podcast started, and what we were selling when we started, and what we're selling right now. Shopify. I love how Shopify has the tools and the resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. I'm telling you, Shopify powers over millions of businesses just like ours from first sale to full scale. So reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash roam, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash r-o-m-e right now. Shopify.com slash r-o-m-e. Damian Lillard. Damian, it's been a moment or two, but it's great to have you on the program. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Good, good. Good to get caught up. So let me start right here. You have faced plenty of challenges over the course of your career. So I'm not going to say, Damian, that this is the most challenging time of your career, but I'm curious, what has this season been like for you from the standpoint of not being able to play for the last six weeks and the team going through rough stretches on the floor? Uh, I mean, it's obviously tough anytime you're not – uh, successful or your team is not successful, especially at a professional level, because it's it's always a conversation and you always want to be putting your best foot forward and making sure that you're performing in a way that's, you know, producing positive results. And um, when you're not healthy to to be a part of that and your team is not having that type of success, you know, it's, it's not fun, but um, it's part of it. And, you know, we can only um, do our best to 
um, work moving forward. So I'm trying to get healthy. Um, our team is continuing to, to fight that fight. We had a big win in Milwaukee last night. And, um, you know, those are the only things that we... So, uh, I mean, obviously, you never, ever want to miss time. But knowing you, I'm sure you're maximizing that time that you're not on the floor. In fact, I know you've been spending some time with your kids and your wife. What has that time been like for you? It's been special. Uh, you know, most of the time, like you said, I'm on the road. I'm in and out. And, you know, we might have a homestand. But even then, we got practice and other things that, you know, we got to be there for, whether it's a team event. Uh, whether it's watching film, whether it's training or whatever, but just um, having this time off, just going to rehab, coming back home, being with my kids, dropping my son off at school, um, being with my wife, going out to dinner, just doing all of those things that I don't typically get to do. Um, it's brought me a lot of peace, you know, especially uh, with me being in a situation that I haven't been in since I've been in the league and missing time because of the injury. So, um, it's, you know, it's been as good as it could be, you know, in my life at home. We're talking to Trailblazers guard Damian Lillard. He is appearing courtesy today of Gatorade's Fuel Tomorrow initiative. Damian, you got married. I want to ask you one more thing about that, if you don't mind. You got married in Montecito in the off season. I personally went to UC Santa Barbara. I got my career start in Santa Barbara. Nothing better than Santa Barbara, Dame, except Montecito. So I've got to ask, what was the wedding like and how is married life treating you? Uh, the wedding was great. You know, I think um, every single person that, that came enjoyed themselves. You know, we had a great time um, leading up to the ceremony. And then after the ceremony, we had a great time that night. And we went off to uh, have a great honeymoon and came home. And it's, it's been fun. You know, I think um, the season getting off to a slow start, me being unhealthy and kind of putting me in a position to where I'm home and as, off, as often as I've been home because of it has you know, just made it even better. You know, not not what I want professionally, but as far as my family and my kids and things like that, um, it's, it's been it's been great. All right, so you know more than anybody else that it is a business, but at the same time, there are personal relationships involved. I'm curious, what were your thoughts when it came official that CJ McCollum was being traded? Uh, I mean, it was it was tough for me to deal with. You know, that's you know, I think it's become a thing in sports. Uh, for people to say, you know, that's my brother. And, you know, they they don't really mean it. You know, they don't really have that type of relationship. But, you know, from the day CJ was drafted, you know, you know we spent a lot of time together. Our, mo our mothers spend a lot of time together till, to this day. For us to be around each other so long and to have so much success as a backcourt, um, and then to see it come to an end, you know, this is the part of the business that you, you never think about when you see somebody every day. But, um, you know, when it actually happened, it was just like, you know, it was it was tough. It was tough on me. And, you know, I still haven't come to grips with it. You know, it still seems weird to to not have him around. You know, I really appreciate that candid response, because I would say even from the outside looking in, like you and I have talked for all these years and he and I have talked for all these years. And even from me way on the outside, Damien, looking at it, it still seems weird. And I'm not either one of you guys. I can only imagine what that must be like for both of you, if it seems weird to most of us on the outside looking in, what about the bigger picture? I mean, you being who you are and somebody who's leading from the front and the face of the franchise, again, you understand this is a business. Have any of these deals caught you off guard or are you on the same page as the organization with these trades? I think our organization, they know where I stand with those things. You know, I've Since I've been in the league, I've been a guy that, um, you know, I build relationships with, with my teammates, the people that come in, you know, I, I build relationships and we bond and, you know, we become friends and I become attached to the people around me. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the exact reason why I'm, I'm not really comfortable participating in, you know, so many things that happen on the business side. Um, as I progressed in my career, you know, they, they try to keep me in a loop and things like that. But, um, when it comes to this, I think it's, it's a situation where I can't, um, you know, tell them what to do. You know, at some point I have to be the player and they have to um, be the, the front office. And I got to respect them doing that the same way they respect me as a player. And, uh, you know, that's that's that. You know, I got to I got to trust that they're making decisions in the best interest of our team. Damian Lourdes joining us today, courtesy of Gatorade's Fuel Tomorrow initiative. We will talk about that momentarily. 
So, Damien, when you see, for instance, from where you're sitting, I understand that you can't control that. They do the deals. You're the player. When you see the deals they're making and how the team is playing right now and you've helped develop some of the younger players, what's it feel like to you? For instance, does it feel like a rebuild or does it feel like you're retooling? I mean, I would say a a retool. You know, you don't take a guy – you know, who's been here for 10 years and pull a rebuild, you know what I'm saying? Like you, I think you put yourself in position to, you know, shake some things up and uh, give yourself some flexibility and opportunity to, um, you know, go get some guys that can come in and help you win. You know, I don't see it as a rebuild. You know, for instance, the reason I ask you and I have talked for years about how much you love Portland, how much you love that fan base, what it would mean to you to win a title with the Blazers. And then over the summer, you were with USA Basketball and you were talking to guys like Kevin Durant, Draymond Green, as well as members of the women's basketball team about what it takes to win a championship. What were some of your biggest takeaways from those conversations? Uh, I mean, we didn't really get too in-depth about, you know, you got to do this or you got to do that to win a championship because sometimes you just you just get lucky. You know, sometimes things just fall in your favor, and that's what it takes sometimes at this level, or that's a part of it. Um, but I think the... The way that it's being done now is, you know, players are, you know, in communication and they're trying to piece teams together and make their team as strong as possible so that they have a chance to win it. And, um, you know, as much as I I do have, you know, guys that I like around the league that I would, you know, love to play with, why wouldn't I? Um, You know, it's just some things that I I know are not me. And, you know, I – I try to go about things in a way to where I'm true to myself, but I'm also not being a fool and not giving myself a a chance to accomplish what I would love to accomplish. So um, my biggest takeaways was just that I'm in a company, uh, I'm in company with the best players in the world, you know, at the Olympics and um, just getting to be on the floor with them and pick their brains and um, be on a team with them. That was my biggest takeaway is just seeing different ways that people do things on the court, a different coaching staff. It was it was more of that than me picking their brains about how did you win the championship because, you know, everybody's way has been different. Sure. Damian Lillard joining us for a few more moments. So what about that experience? What was the experience of winning a gold medal like for you? It was a great experience. Um, you know, it wasn't the full experience because of COVID and, you know, us not being able to do much, but, Uh, visiting the Olympic Village and seeing the rings and seeing all the athletes and the opening ceremonies and things like that. Um, You know, to me, that was when I finally bought into like, man, like we are representing our country. When I got there, I was like, I don't know if this is like, you know, how how into this I I really am. And then when we got there and, you know, you walking down the tunnel, getting ready, you know, to be announced. And every country is like, chanting and shouting and stuff like that. And then it started to get competitive, like, oh, you know, like it's them against us. And, um, you know, that was when I got into it. And I think the opening ceremonies was the, the best part of the experience, just meeting all the different athletes from different countries and different sports. Um, I spent most of my time, um, you know, walking up to the opening ceremonies with boxers. I just love boxing. So I was with all the, the fighters and it was a great experience. I know you love boxing, Damien. So I got to ask you, you, you love boxing. You understand business. And I'm not in, in any way looking to start anything at all. I'm really curious, though, because you love boxing. You're an old school boxing guy. I love boxing. I grew up on boxing. What do you make of Jake Paul? I respect it. Um, I think any time, you know, you can um, bring more eyes to, to the sport. You know, a lot of people... Um, only watch prize fighters and the big name fighters and they don't really watch the sport or care for the sport. And um, I think he's bringing, he's bringing more fans to the sport. And um, I also respect the fact that, you know, he's not just jumping in the ring um, and not respecting the craft. You see him getting better and better. You see him in the gym. Um, And I respect that, you know, it's a, it's, you can you can die in the ring. A lot of people have, and you know it takes a lot of a lot of courage uh, to get in there and, and handle your business. So I respect the fact that he's been doing it. Hmm. Damian Lillard, my guest, I agree with you, and I think he is getting better. And he's doing business. He's doing business, and he's doing smart business. Gatorade is providing this opportunity, so I'm going to ask you about that in one second. 
Damien, one last thought about your situation, because again, you and I have talked so much about Portland and what it means to you. You're a huge sports fan. Matthew Stafford played 12 years, Damien, with Detroit. You know this. Last offseason, he had a tough conversation with the team. He asked to be dealt. They dealt him to the Rams. He just won a Super Bowl. Could you ever see yourself in a situation like that? Um, I think Matthew Stafford um, in Detroit. I'm not sure. What did they make the playoffs in that first 12 years? Once or twice? He's played three times in the playoffs. Three times in, in 12 years. You know, if that was my experience, then I probably would have got to that point. But, you know, being here, I've been in the playoffs every year of my career outside of my rookie year. And I've had, you know, tough runs in the playoffs, and I've had very successful runs in the playoffs. So, you know, I've gotten that experience and I've gained a better understanding of what it takes to win at that level, even making it to the Western Conference Finals um, while our team was dealing with a lot of injuries. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for Golden State's run that they had over those, you know, few years, who knows what that could have meant for us. So just getting a taste of being at that level and understanding what it takes and um, knowing that our team could have been better with our injury and, um, knowing that now, you know, we got talent and we got opportunity to even, you know, get more players. You know, I feel I feel confident about my my chances, um, you know, seeing things through as, as I want to, as long as we um, execute this plan. Damian Lillard, my guest. All right, so you're working with Gatorade and the Fuel Tomorrow initiative to remove the barriers the kids face in sport and to give millions the opportunity to play. Why is this a personal project that is so important to you? Uh, it's it's super important to me just because it's it's something that falls in line with what I believe and something that I care about. Good that you know when I was in the fourth grade, I signed myself up to play for the team. And the older I got, it was like you know things cost. You know you got to pay for facilities, you got to pay to get your gear and your team shoes and all of those things. And those are just a few things that. Um, provide a block for kids to be able to participate and for kids to be able to experience that that bond and knowing what it means to be unselfish and be a part of a team. But it's a lot of things that that block their opportunity. So the fact that Gatorade is committed to, you know, giving so many kids around the world a, a better opportunity and, and uh, giving them resources and an opportunity to do that, um, I'm all I'm all for that and I'm on board because it's it's a real issue. You know, something that I've I've seen from it, my personal experience. Um, and it's it's necessary. You know, kids participating in sports is on a decline. And we don't want to see that. You know, we there's so many other ways and so many other things for kids to get involved that's that's not always positive. Um that you you want to make sure that you're giving them every opportunity to um to experience sports and being a part of a team and, and just being pushed in that direction. Cause there's so many things in my life, uh, so many lessons that I've learned from playing sports and being coached and being on the team and dealing with teammates and going on, you know, AAU trips and winning and losing and adversity. You, you just learn so much from um, playing sports and being on the team that even if that's not what you're going to do for your life, there's, there's a lot of valuable lessons to be learned in it. And uh, I'm all for Gatorade uh, providing that opportunity for millions of kids. Clones, what do you want when you're craving protein or you need more energy? Not bars, not sugary snacks, not energy drinks. You want beef, pure and simple. Where's the beef? It's in a package of Old Trapper Beef Jerky. Old Trapper is not your old man's jerky. Shriveled, dry, tasteless. Old Trapper Beef Jerky is made from lean strips of steak and quality spices that are smoked over a real wood fire. It's tender, it's tasty, it's not tough. And why is it so good? Because Old Trapper is a 50-year-old family business known for its relentless commitment to quality. They take smoked beef extremely seriously and you can taste it in every single bite. Old Trapper is packed with protein. It comes in four amazing flavors to satisfy all your cravings. 
quality smoked meat at its finest. It goes with you wherever you go, to the game, to the gym, to the beach. So look for Old Trapper in the Clearview bag. You can see the quality you're buying. Look for it in major retail stores near you. Clones, if you do not see it, ask for it by name because no other jerky compares Old Trapper or What's Your Beef. Their head coach is Matt McMahon. Matt, it is good to have you back. How are you? Jim, great to be back with you. I appreciate you having us on. It's good to have you on. Always good to have you on. In fact, it's been a moment or two since you and I last spoke. So bring me up to date. Matt, you're in the top 25. You're undefeated in a conference play. You've lost only one game since November 22nd. How are you and what is the vibe like around the program right now and on campus? A lot of excitement here at Murray State. Though that intro song brought back some bad memories of uh, Welcome to the Jungle, our last trip down to Auburn. Uh, But we haven't lost since that game. And uh, we're blessed with some great players. We've, we've got Tevin Brown and K.J. Williams, who are two of the best players in Murray State history. Uh, and then elite point guard play with Juice Hill, uh, who's been terrific and great balance with our team. So ESPNU game tomorrow night, a lot of excitement here in Murray, Kentucky. You know, I was going to ask you about both those guys and even the Auburn game. I've got a thought on that Auburn game I want to ask you about. But let me ask you this. In terms of Tevin Brown, who you mentioned, your guys rave about your energy. But he said this about you, quote, the man's full of energy at all times. He's always on the go. Just as Hill added, you'll never see Coach Mack coming in on a bad day with low energy. Listen, it's a long season. There are going to be days, I would imagine, where it's tough. It's a grind. How do you manage to keep up that high energy and that juice every single day? Oh, I just have a good time. I'm coaching college basketball for a living. Uh, you know, what What else could I rather be doing? So it's it's a blast. Uh, it's a lot more fun when you have really good players, and, and I put an asterisk by that, really good players who are bought into the culture of the program. So I uh, really enjoy coaching this group. Been a hardworking group, very unselfish, and they just find different ways to win. You know, we were down nine on Saturday with five minutes to go at Moorhead State. They had the third longest home winning streak in the country. Our guys went on an 11-0 run and found a way to win. So uh, we have some tough guys who can really play. We're talking Murray State basketball. One of those guys, of course, the aforementioned Tevin Brown. Last month, he set the school record for career three-pointers. What has he meant to the program since he arrived? Well, he was part of uh, arguably the best recruiting class in school history. Uh, Came in with another guard named Ja Morant. And uh, Shaq Buchanan, who's now in the G League with the Memphis Hustle. And uh, he'll finish here top eight in scoring all time, top five in assists, top five in steals. Uh, And he'll go down as one of the great three-point shooters in college basketball history. So uh, just a winner. He does a little bit of everything to impact winning on both ends of the court. Hey, Matt, I remember that guy, Jaw Morant. In fact, skipping ahead of that, yeah. since you mentioned him, when you were on in the past, we've talked about Jaw and what he meant to the program. He is now an all-star game starter in just his third season. I mean, he is so young that he could still be playing at Murray State. Are you at all surprised by how quickly he has taken his place among the NBA's elite? No, I'm not surprised at all. I think we talked about that with all the NBA teams and, and guys like yourself as we went through the process. Everybody gets wowed and amazed by the freakish athleticism and explosiveness and unbelievable court vision and all those things. But most importantly, he's a he's a culture builder. Guys want to play with him. He makes everyone else around him better. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, Grizzlies got the third best record in the league, and so not surprised at all. Just really happy for him and. Look forward to watching that All-Star game next weekend. I think that's really awesome what you just said, that it's his athleticism and his explosiveness, as great as they are, might not even be the best things about him, that he's a great culture builder. To that point, he's come back to campus numerous times since he was drafted, and there have been a lot of pickup games. What are those battles like when he comes back? Well, he, he doesn't uh... – He doesn't look to score as much as he would in the NBA game. He likes getting other guys involved when he comes back. But uh, obviously, uh, I think by rule, I'm not allowed to watch those. So I've never seen one of those games. Uh, But I've heard they've been high level. All right. So, Matt, you talked about the Auburn game. That's the one game you've lost since last November. That was on the road at Auburn. And they spent some time in number one this season. Even though you lost – were you able to take something from that game that's going to prepare you for the rest of the season and for the NCAA tournament? I hope so, Jim. You know, that was the third time we played them, uh, and we've been close 
uh, the, the previous two times, and we w- went on to go to the NCAA tournament. Uh, each year we've played them, and, and obviously hope that will be the case again this year. Uh, but I think you know, your players take away some confidence. Uh, it's the best environment in college basketball right now, uh, so it prepares you for league play, going on the road and finding ways to win. Uh, and then hope we get some confidence from going you know, toe-to-toe with a five-point game with like 14 minutes to go in the second half. Uh, so you get some confidence that you can play with the best in the country. If, if I had it to do over again, though, Jim, we would have just gone down there and shot 60 or 73 because you're just you're wasting your time trying to score over Walker Kessler in the post. He blocks everything. Uh, it's their interior defense is just incredible. I feel you. Matt McMahon joining us. And, Matt, obviously you're looking to win the conference and the conference tournament, but do you feel like your team has shown enough to earn an, an at-large bid if it comes to that? Well, I mean, it's awfully early, Jim. You know, we got a lot more work to do. But if you do look at the resume, uh, we're 26 right now in the Kempom. You know, we try and control the things that we can control, which our non-conference schedule ranks six, uh, the six toughest out of those 26 teams, uh, and try and keep handling our business in league. You know, the top of our league's really good with more Moorhead and Belmont. Uh, so we, we have a, a really good Belmont team next week and then the tournament, some more opportunities uh, to add to the resume. But you know, I've been really proud of our players. They've, they've done a great job just staying focused on the next game. I know everyone's really excited uh, to have a national TV game in here in front of a full house uh, tomorrow night on ESPN. That is exciting. That's always exciting. You know, the program, Matt, is always so interesting to me. You're the head coach there, and you're following in the footsteps of the likes of McCronin. Billy Kennedy, Steve Prohm. What is it about this job that attracts such great coaches? I, I'm not sure the tradition just continues to build. I think it started back in 1978. Ron Green was a former player, and uh, he was the SEC Coach of the Year at Mississippi State uh, and left Mississippi State to come back and rebuild the, his, his alma mater's program. Uh, and really it's been four de- decades of excellence uh, ever since. And I think what you have here, you're able to recruit elite players. Uh, we've now been able to, to have multiple NBA players come from our program. You have great facilities and you have a fan base. that's it's really loyal and passionate about racer basketball. It's, it's, uh, it's a unique place. You know, you look up in the stands behind the, uh, the bench at games and you have multiple generations of families, uh, there cheering for the racers. So it's a special place been a lot of winning over the years here hey man not only that but in addition to all those great things that you just mentioned that could be attractive to a lot of people coming in there's also the dq that's not that far up the road speaking of prom <laughs> he and i used to talk about that dq in murray kentucky we're less than two weeks away from the dq opening up for the season do you ever head over there and treat yourself or are you focused only on clean burning fuel <laughs> Well, but Prom had the VIP car. He had a key to the back door there <laughs> Great. Uh, at the DQ. So, no, we try and stay away from there. But uh, it is one of the uh, famous landmarks here in Murray, Kentucky. Matt McMahon is joining me. Really quickly, we talked about, or I should say quickly, we talked about Tevin Brown. When you have Brown and then you have a guy like K.J. Williams and they're going off for a combined 60 points and 18 rebounds in their last two games, how much flexibility does that give you as a coach in terms of having multiple ways to win and dominate? I think it's one of the reasons we've had so much success to this point is that balance. We have three guys, and Tevin, K.J., and Juice Hill, who have all had 30-point games this year. Uh, K.J. Williams was unbelievable this weekend. He's averaging a double-double in league play, 6'10", 245. And can really do a little bit of everything, Jim. You know, it was the National Player of the Week uh, this week, averaged 30 and 9. Uh, had 31 points in the second half of our win on Thursday. So uh, I think that balance. And then the other thing is we're one of six teams in the country that rank top 20 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. Uh, and so that gives us multiple ways to be able to win games, having those weapons. Uh, but then also the offensive and defensive balance. Well, Matt, as you said, lots of work still to be done, plenty of ball to be played, but you are number 21 in both polls. Murray State, 24-2, and 14-0 and 0 in conference play. Austin P at Murray State tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern. It's a big one. Matt, good to have you back. Good luck. Great to have you on the program, as always. 
Thanks, Jim. Appreciate you welcoming us back to the jungle. Take care. The best athletes know that your championship body is not built in a day. The same is true when it comes to your long-term financial goals. Get financially fit with M1, the finance super app. It's commission-free, and it makes growing your money easier so you can strategize for the end game. Build a custom portfolio or choose a pre-built portfolio that speaks to your goals. Then, automate your everyday money moves and use your extra time to watch the highlights. They even make it easy to stick to your investing strategy by automatically rebalancing your investments every time you buy into your portfolio, keeping your investments close to where you want them. That way, your portfolio sticks to the plan for the long game. No huddle ups necessary. Visit m1finance.com sports. That's M with the number one. Sign up and see why money, Investopedia, and Yahoo Finance are proud super fans of M1. That's M the number one dot com slash sports investing involves risk including the risk of loss m1 finance llc member finra sipc all right so quickly Bengals fan seems to me i know you're still processing sunday's super bowl loss and it's tough and it was right there and you had it i get that but i do have some good news actually some amazing news scud averted Star quarterback Joe Burrow's fourth quarter right knee injury is not as serious as first feared. He will not require surgery, according to NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. The injury is going to require some rehab, but the sprain should not impact his offseason schedule. In other words, sigh of bleeping relief, a.k.a. Thank your lucky bleeping stars, Cincy fan, that those matadors in front of Joe Cool did not cost him another lengthy rehab, like the one from his torn ACL that ended his rookie campaign. And consider this yet another warning to the Bengals organization as they approach free agency and the draft, that even if they have tried to get him some help, they have not done nearly enough. And by not nearly enough, they need to do everything in their power to do something about those matadors in front of him that seem hell-bent on getting this cat killed as he enters the prime of his career. This is not an overreaction. Behind this line, this cat's life is literally at risk every single time he drops back to pass. This unit is bad, really bad. Or in the words of one functionally illiterate jungle staffer, no names mentioned, James Kelly. They're ass. They're even serial ass. Serial ass. And addressing it is not enough. They need to go all in. They need to do anything and everything they can to protect this dude. Because no matter how tough Joe Burrow is, and he is that, nobody can survive that beating that he has been taking and will continue to take if they do not fully address the problem. And yes, I understand they have kind of sort of tried to get better. They have not done nearly enough. I mean, make no mistake. No one has ever overcome more than Burrow did this season to make and nearly win a Super Bowl. Again, this is not hyperbole. When I called this guy a supernova yesterday and somebody took offense to it, it was another really bad take on your part. I'm going to say it again. Nobody has ever overcome more to come that close to winning a Super Bowl. I said it for two weeks leading up to kickoff Sunday night. Again, not an overreaction. Not even just an opinion or a statement, but a bleeping fact. CBSSports.com dug up the data to back this up. Check this out. Since 1970... In that 52-season span, there have only been 55 instances of a quarterback being sacked 50 times during the regular season. Only Joe Burrow, who was body-bagged 51 times during the 2021 season, and his Bengals made it to the Super Bowl. Only team ever. Take that for data. Right? And again, not to channel the still functionally illiterate big head here, but that right there is the very definition of ass. In fact, historical ass. Serial and it's not ass. even 51 sacks. This guy was sacked 70 times 
including the postseason. 70, the third most in NFL history. And the most incredible thing is, a few more seconds on maybe even one pass, one bleeping pass, and this cat rips the Lombardi. So I know some of you don't buy it. I know some of you are sick of hearing about the greatness of Joe Cool. Yeah, well, the truth is, not only are you sick of it, you're going to be even more sick of it because you're not hearing it enough. And on this show, you're going to hear it more and more. No quarterback has ever pulled off what that guy just did, let alone in his second season. Seriously, what Burrow did was some of the most incredible bleep ever. This dude was still the top-rated quarterback by PFF despite his incompetent, non-blocking, bungle colleagues in front of him. And speaking on behalf of all the Bengal fans, flush this line of turnstiles and move the hell on. We're going to flush it and move on. You've got over 50 mil in cap space because, of course, you're the Bengals. You always have money. You sort of you never spend it, but you always have money. You have a ton of money in cap space, you have an entire draft, and you could not possibly do any worse up front, and there are absolutely no excuses why this cannot be fixed. I always say, give me an A or give me an F, but the truth is, even a D- minus from those matadors might have won you a Super Bowl, Bengals fan. So if you don't fix it quickly... And I don't care how cool Joe is. I don't care how tough Joe is. My man is going to be joining Andrew Luck in daddy daycare. Unless you get this guy this, the help he needs. Because nobody can take that abuse. Not even the great Joe Burrow. The hell with flushing it, actually. Take some ether to that room. Light that match and finally fix this thing by burning it to the ground. 51 sacks, and he had them in the Super Bowl. 70 on the year, and he was probably within one pass of hoisting the Lombardi. Seriously, this podcast is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. I love this product. I use it. Now, let me ask you this. Does this sound familiar? You've got the one device that allows you to catch the game live, Another one that lets you stream your favorite programs, you watch sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbors, best friends, log in for all the good stuff. Listen, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all of that entertainment that you love without all that hassle. It's called DirecTV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again, and the best part, there is no annual contract. Get rid of the clutter and the confusion. Get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Desmond Ritter is my guest. Desmond, good to have you back. How are you? Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Always good to have you. You too. You too. So let me talk to you about your accomplishments at Cincinnati. In fact, I'll get there in a second. But earlier this month, you were at the Senior Bowl and you were named the Offensive Player of the Game. What was that week like for you? And then how pleased were you with the way you showed up? Yeah, so that was a long week, you know, not only for myself, but every other player there, uh, both mentally and physically. Um, You know, mentally every day. Um, We have practice every day. We have uh, team meetings to go over practice film. And then, you know, with that, um, we're doing hours and hours of interviews in which, you know, you can go through these, these 32 teams and interviews and say almost the same thing 32 times. Um, but each time, you know, you have to be yourself um, and tell your own story how it is. Um, so, you know, that was a little draining, whether that was, you know, a two-hour interview in the morning and then four- to five-hour interviews at night. Um, and then, you know, one thing that, you know, I just wanted to do there was, you know, just show that I could get better day in and day out and continue to do that. You know, the first day I went in, and, you know, I think all the quarterbacks had a pretty good day. Um, second day, it was a little rainy, um, so they got to see, you know, wet ball drill, kind of how you handle weather conditions. Um, and I thought I, I thought I kind of stood out. And then, you know, the third day, it was the, the last day before the game that we were actually going to practice, um, put together a good red zone day, and then obviously went into the game and, and had myself a day. 
I like that. That's a really good response as to what goes on there during that week. I was going to ask you what's it like from a football standpoint. Check that box for me. I was going to ask you what it was like to get with the Jets coaching staff. You check that box for me. Desmond Ritter is my guest. One AFC scout did say when talking to ESPN, when he was asked about you, he said from a mechanic standpoint, this is a quote now, from a mechanic standpoint, he's picture perfect. End of quote. I know you've worked with my guy Jordan Palmer. So what's it mean to you to hear a scout saying that your mechanics are perfect? Do you feel they are? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say they're perfect because, um, you know, I feel like no one's mechanics are perfect because um, everyone can, you know, sit out here in, in sunny California and, you know, post videos or whatever it may be of, of going out and throwing and having so-called perfect mechanics. Um, but then you get into a game-like uh, atmosphere and, you know, some of the things that you did in the off offseason, um, you know, you might not do in-game, whether that's you have a, a, a D-line rushing at you or whatever it may be. Um, so for him to say I have perfect mechanics, um, that's great, but you know I'm, I'm going to continue to to keep bettering my mechanics and you know try to be the best in that area of my game as I can. Desmond Ritter is my guest. You know, you and I could talk about how great everything is, but you know how the process goes, right? There are going to be scouts who talk about what you do really well, and then there are going to be scouts and unnamed sources and anonymous people who are looking to pick your game apart for whatever reason, whatever their agenda is. You know that that negativity is kind of stuff that can get in somebody's head if they let it. So, what's your approach to dealing with that? Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had this conversation out here at the, at the quarterback draft house um, kind of recently. And, you know, for me, it's kind of how it's always been growing up. Um, you know, I've never really let anyone tell me what I can and can't do because um, I know at the end of the day everything's my decision and I'm going to be able to go out there and do whatever I want to do. Um, so, you know, when, when all the negativity, whether it's negative or positive, really, um, you know, I just kind of keep to myself and keep pushing. Um, and, you know, I'm not a person who, who likes to be complacent or, or be complacent in anything that I do. Um, I'm always looking to, to get better and strive to be better and be the best. Um, so that, that's kind of how I live. Like my daily mentality is just, you know, every day it's kind of cliche, but get 1% better in anything that you do. Desmond Ritter's getting ready for the NFL draft. I get that. Now, you put up huge numbers in your time at Cincinnati, but you also led the program to the college football playoff, making you the first group of five team to reach the CFP. How much pride then is there for you in the mark that you left on that program? Oh, I take huge pride in that. You know, one thing that Coach Fick um, kind of told us when we came in was, you know, leave the place better than what you found it. And he's told that to, to the team and the senior classes every single year. Um, so for me to come into, you know, two back-to-back four and eight seasons um, and then come in and change the program around, um, you know, it means, it means a lot to me. But, you know, it wasn't just myself. Um, it, it was guys like Maje Sanders, guys like Kobe Bryant, you know, Ahmad Gardner, um, Cortez Bryant. I mean, just you could, there's a long list of names in which you could say, um, you know, who kind of changed the program around to be what it is today. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just from this past year or the year before, but, you know, literally the past four or five years of, you know, since I've been there is, you know, what we were building to, to become. And, you know, I think the guys that are there now and, you know, going through winter workouts about to start spring ball, um, they're going to embark on a, on a completely new journey, losing 34 seniors. Um, a lot of those guys were, you know, had leadership roles on the team. Um, so, you know, they're going to um, find themselves and, and embark on their new journey to, to start something bigger and better than what we did last year. We are talking to Desmond Ritter once again. You mentioned Coach Fick. It was announced yesterday that he had signed an extension to stay at Cincinnati with the success that he has had. His name, of course, was coming up for numerous other opportunities. What's it mean to you personally to know that he's going to be staying there? Uh, I mean, one, it's just loyalty, and two, honestly, it's honesty. Um, you know, he's told us from, you know, I think it was like two years ago when you know, the, the coaching carousel kind of happened and there were talks to him going to other places and, you know, interviewing at Michigan State. Um, and, you know, he sat us down and told us he wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, he loves Cincinnati. He loves the state of Ohio, you know, not only for football but for recruiting. Um, loves the guys that come out of there. And, you know, we talk about culture as a big thing at Cincinnati. Um, and we talk about tough and nasty and a, a blue-collar program. And, you know, you, you don't find them not, you know, making any bad statements or anything, but, you, you know, sometimes you don't find those guys out here in California. Um, where hey, you really hey, find hey, those hey, hey, yo, know, yo, know, yo, yo, don't be like know, that, I'm, dude. I know, I Don't know. be like that, dude. Uh, Come on now. But, you know, where you find those guys is, is, is Ohio and Kentucky where it's not, you know, sunshines and rainbows every single day where, um, you know, the, the clouds are droomy and, and everything, you know, isn't all good. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of the culture he builds, and that's what he likes to build up as a program and, and you know, those guys he likes to be around. And so – you know, I'm not surprised that, you know, he's staying. 
Um, like I said, he told us that from day one that he wasn't going to go anywhere, and you know he's kept his word, and uh, I'm glad Cincinnati could help him out with that. Desmond Ritter joining us. You know me, I'm going to cover uh, my hometown, but there is something to that. You're right. When it is 78 degrees every single day of the year, there is a certain – we don't deal with certain elements that there are other parts of the country that have to deal with when it comes to weather and grit and grind and things like that. I see you working. Listen, when you think back to when you were 17 – and you first arrived on campus to where you are right now, getting ready for the draft, looking to be a high draft pick. Is that the journey that you expected? Is there anything surprising about that? Or is this pretty much what you expect, what you expected or where you expected to end up? Um, you know, when I was 17, you know, I didn't know what my future would hold. Um, like I said, uh, I still at 17, I was a guy who wanted to get better every single day. But, you know, when I went in there at 17, I also told my coaches, um, Coach Gino Gadouli, Coach Mike Denbrock, um, with my quarterback coach and OC, I, I sat down and told him, I said, look, you know, I want to be the best quarterback who's ever came from Cincinnati. And, you know, I'm telling that to Gino Gadouli, who, you know, was the best quarterback at Cincinnati at the time, um, who had all the records and everything. And, and so I'm sitting there telling him that, um, telling him, you know, I want to go be a first round pick. I want to, you know, take Cincinnati to another level. So, you know, I didn't know what the process was going to be like of getting there as being a, a young 17 year old adult um, slash teenager. But, you know, I knew it was going to take a lot of hard work and dedication and, and build a team. Um, you know, Coach Fick, one statement that he always also makes is, um, you know, individual success is built from team success. And, you know, I feel like I'm a, I'm a perfect product of that because, you know, without my team, I wouldn't be in the position where I'm at today. All right, so you're looking for a team success, obviously, and you want to lead from the front. You are your own guy. I understand that. But as you look around the NFL right now, who are some NFL quarterbacks maybe that you look up to both as players and leaders? Yeah, um, so, so both as players and leaders, you know, you look at guys like Joe Burrow, um, look at guys like, you know, Ryan Tannehill, um, obviously, you know, Matt Ryan, Tom Brady, those, those two names are, um, have been in the league for a long time. People respect them. Um, and then you look at guys like Joe Burrow and Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, and, you know, those are the younger guys who have been able to come in and take control of the offense, and not only the offense, but the locker room. Um, and, you know, I think that's one thing that really separates me from a lot of other guys is how well I connect, you know, within a locker room so quick, um, just so, of so how I'm a, so adaptable. Um, but, you know, those are the, the guys that I kind of look up to as far as, um, you know, the, the leaders of the league and, and how they do their, their job so well. So now, obviously, between now and the start of the draft, you've got a lot on your plate. You're locked in. You're focused. But recall, the last time you and I spoke, we talked about your daughter, Leighton, and fatherhood. She's about to turn 10 months old now. How is she doing, and what's the first 10 months to a year been like for you? Yeah, she's doing great. Um, so she, she's she been standing up, um, obviously, on both legs. But um, she just started to use her, her like little walking machine. Um, for the first time the other day so that was interesting to, to kind of see her get walking with that so um, I would say within the next month you know we're going to be on uh, stand on two legs with no support and uh, on the move um, but you know she she's made me you know the happiest man alive and you know the, there's no not going to be one person or anything that that could make me as happy as she does um, but you know she, she just taught me how to be selfless um, you know how everything I do I do for her no matter if it's um, waking up, going to get a cup of coffee, working out, you know, going to extra meetings. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, everything I do, I do for her. It's an amazing perspective for somebody your age. As far as her getting up, I'm sure that's pretty exciting. As far as you being a high-level athlete, I'm sure you want to see that. But understand this, man. As somebody who's been there before, once they get up and they start moving around, look out, bro. Because yeah. then, then no. they're getting up and they're moving around, all right? And you can I never mean, take your eyes off them. Yeah, we, we've already figured that out with, with the crawling stage. You know, it started out where she started to crawl backwards about two steps, and then, you know, she got the crawling forward, but it was slow and, you know, maybe like a 10 feet in about 20 minutes, and then now it's, you know, she's taken off with the crawling, and you got to go chase her and catch her. So, you know, as being an athlete, and I know she's going to be an athlete, once she get up on those two legs, she's going to be taken off. Dude, she's already working on her back pedal. That's incredible. <laughs> The draft is coming up on April 28th, and he had a great, great college career at Cincinnati. Former Cincinnati quarterback Desmond Ritter, my guest. Desmond, great to get caught up. As soon as you find out where you're going to live and work, I'll look for you again. So good luck with all that pre-draft work, and we'll do it again soon, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Let's get Someone you can rely, who's always on your side. That's why there's Nationwide. That's why there's Nationwide. Nationwide is on your side. Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company and Affiliates, Columbus, Ohio. 
the beef segment, starting with this social call now. One phone line open, 1-800-636-8686. This person's going to set the tone. Mr. Rome, my beef is with those rich people driving very expensive brand new cars, talking on their cell phones while holding it to their face. Did nobody tell them they have Bluetooth in their rig? We're driving on a parkway and parking in a driveway. Dean in the FTW. Tantrum Gasm tweets, Sir Romanoff, beef when birds walk. Effing things can fly. Billions of humans fantasize about flying. We build massive machines to replicate it, but no. They just have to waddle around on the ground like the buttholes they are. War Corvallis. Jim Master, my beef is with the 20-year-old rusted bowl we call Mile High Stadium, Sports Authority Field, Invesco, Empower Field, or the house that Elway tore down. The geniuses who designed our bowl of iron did not think that it was worth putting on a lid. So we can never host a Super Bowl, and we paid multi-multi-millions for a house that is used less than a dozen times a year. Idiots! Ron in Colorado. Straight take. Jim, hi. I've got a beef with Roger Goodell. Always handing the Lombardi to the team owner first. I get that they scratch the checks, but nobody wants to see that trolley Grandpa Joe lookalike Stan Kroenke. We're there for Wonder Boy Sean, Old Man Wit, A.D., and Matthew Stafford. Vince, Illinois. Jim, my beef is with the haters that claim Subway's tuna sandwich is not real tuna. I don't care if it's flavored styrofoam. I love it, and I'm going to get one right now. Brian in Detroit. Jimmy. My beef is with everything happens for a reason, guy. Hey, buddy, explain the reason why some schmuck smashed into my car, and decided to get out of Dodge before exchanging info. Now I'm stuck waiting for the insurance adjuster to run his ass down. Mike in mini. Alvin appreciates all the bell emojis, Mike. Yeah, dude. Hey, Rome, my beef. I accidentally swapped my lunch with my kid's lunch. Now my coworkers refer to me as, quote, Juice box. Chad from Orlando. That's good. I like that. There's your winner so far. Romy the Clown. People who roll into self-checkout registers at the grocery store with a full cart of groceries are the worst. I just want to pay for my six-pack of Natty Light, Slim Jims, and get out of here. I hope those people step in gum on their way through the parking lot. Don't get me started on people who let their kids use the self-checkout. Dan in Raleigh, Uh, I want to warn you about this next one. It's a lot. It's from Abigail at Romy's My Homie. Jimmers, I've got massive beef with I don't pee in the shower guy. Look, you psychopath. I once had to fire out a torpedo in a public shower in Ensenada, and I was extremely proud of myself. Signed, Abby, in San Diego. Wore the co-ed who walked into that nightmare next. War Lady Clone. Oh, my God, Abby. Really? And you're, you're calling him a psychopath? Abby, I'm not sure I want, you, I want to be your homie anymore. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Jimbo. My beef is going to the movies, ordering a popcorn that I have to fill out a loan document to afford, only to have that zit-faced teenager be a cheap ass and give me one squirt of butter on the top. I enjoy one bite of delicious, heart-clogging, buttery popcorn before choking down the rest of the dry styrofoam with the help of my $10 soda. Dan in rainy Portland. Hey, Jim. (laughs) I like this guy. One, he's from Irvine, and two, he wrote this. 
After having been in Vegas this past weekend for the Super Bowl, my longstanding beef was firmly reminded. For the big bet guy who wagered five bucks on a prop bet to win $4.30 and then scream and yell like he won the lottery. Aim high and keep reaching for the stars, idiot. Reno in Irvine. Got a boy, Reno. Jim, my beef is with the coworker that walks by when I'm eating my lunch and feels the need to say, something smells good. Yeah, I know, Lisa. That's why I'm eating it. Keith in Milwaukee. Rome, my beef is with people who put unrinsed dishes in the dishwasher. Dear good Samaritans, it doesn't save us time. It actually adds more time because we have to pull it out and wash and scrub off the crusty food that's dried before it can be washed. Jeff from PDX. Dude, who are you talking to? Your kids? Your kids? Your wife? Who? What? This says, I have beef with the Rams calling SoFi Stadium our house. That's like I Ray spray painting his freeway overpass wall my house it's not your house rams it's whatever this week's visiting team happens to be unwar bandwagon la fans jim in san clemente jim my beef is with co-workers who can't read emails all the way to the bottom chances are high that if i took the time to write all that nonsense out your stupid question had already been answered read don't make me go all per my previous email on your ass G in the OC. Tance Mack, my beef is with the old dude who checks your receipt when leaving Costco. He's wasting all his time sketching happy faces on the back of your receipt for baby Johnny. Meanwhile, the line gets out the door and is now 30 cards deep. Nobody cares about your stupid smiley faces. Check the damn receipt. Get the line moving. Butthole. 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 Brandon in the ABQ. Dear Jim. My beef is with 98% of basketball players who make or miss a free throw, having to take 15 seconds to high-five all their teammates, including the guy all the way back at midcourt. Nothing like barely grazing the rim or missing it all together and wandering around getting support from guys while we're all thinking, get the hell on with it, Mr. 35% shooter. Let's all do ourselves a favor and punish free throw shot celebrants with a technical foul whenever they delay the game. Joe in Houston, Rome Slice, my beef is with Kathleen from Dogaha, Nebraska. Stop calling the Jim Rome Show without acknowledging the host. That's like going into somebody's house, taking milk from the fridge, and not acknowledging the owner of the house. Put some respect on Jim Rome's name, you kook. Boogie down Brooks in Lake Charles. I like this guy a lot, actually. Snags. My beef is the high school baseball dad and the relentless use of terrible cliches. Let it travel. That's a great take, kid. At a baby. Hunt fastballs. Give it a rest and keep stuffing your face with seeds. War Eagle, Clubber, and HB. I say like half those things. The guy's so right, though. He's so right. Hey, really quickly, Chalk, do I keep reading these or should we go to the phones? You tell me. Let's try some phones. There's actually a lot of other socials. But let's go to the phones. Speak of the devil. Really? Bob in L.A. Bob in L.A., I know you got beef. What's up? Jumbo, Buona Jim. I am so pissed off, Jim, at those golfers that enter a sand trap and fail to rake the trap behind them, ruining it for the rest of us. Making us feel that when we get there, all we'd like to do is to catch up to that butthole, get him on the ground, grab a rake, and rake his face. I am out. Oh, man. Bob in L.A. Not original, but I like the way you delivered that. Nice job. 1-800-636-8686. Let's go to NoCal. Tony, what is your beef? Hey, Jim. Thanks for this time because uh, we got a major construction site beef up here in NoCal. You know, a lot of us travel far, and when we get to the site early, we try to catch a few Zs before the whistle blows. But we get these numbskulls that pull in and leave their lights on. A hundred percent of the time, it's millennial. Well, well, here, damn it, well, hear this, millennial. This is your warning. Turn your lights off. Don't or don't be shocked 
when you come out to four flat tires, I'm tired of it, Rome. I'm so – I'm just upset, man. Yeah, thank you, you are. For- All right, Tony, thank you very much. Hey, Millennials, he wants to sleep on the job. <laughs> Speak of the devil, let's go to Omaha. Kathleen in Omaha. Kathleen, what is your beef? Hooba Stank, <clears throat> Stank is one of the worst band names ever. What in the world is a Hooba, and why do they stank? <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> One eight hundred six three six eight six eight six. Bang through telephone calls. It's part of the beef segment. Let's go to. Oh wait, Sesame Street. Elmo, Elmo, do you have a beef? Hey Jim, Elmo's beef is with Mike McCarthy making my friend Cookie Monster sad. He came out of Sesame Street thinking he was on the road to the Super Bowl, and while he was there, he ate all the cookies and almost ate his hand. I wonder if Oscar the Grouch is going to call. Let's quickly go to Omaha, Shannon. Shannon, what's your beef? Hey, Jim. First time, long time. Listening since you first came to Omaha in the 90s. Hey, my beef is with almonds. You heard me right. Almonds. You go to a break, come back, can't get your words right. I'm cruising through my house looking for a snack. Whammo! I'm on the kitchen floor fighting for my life. They're ninjas of the nut world. They'll put you to the ground. I'm out. You're right, dude. And I keep eating them, and you're right. I have come out of breaks, and I have fought to get my words out, and it's always the almonds. Good night now! Someone you can rely Who's always on your side That's why there's Nationwide That's why there's Nationwide Nationwide is on your side. Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company and Affiliates, Columbus, Ohio.